New desk, much better for working, especially because, and actually I've just thought this now, these laptops, as you probably know, perform just as well on battery as they do when they're plugged into the charger. And I mean, all laptops are portable, obviously, but there's just something about this, uh, the fact that I can get that full performance for several hours actually away from the charger. It's kind of transformed how I work and actually none of this was even in my script. I've just sort of started waffling because I was playing with my desk. So um, let's start the review properly. Hey guys, I'm Tom the Tech Chap and I've got a whole bunch of MacBook Pros here. This is the 16, this is the 14, I've got another 16. I've also got M1 Pro and M1 Max configurations as well as the old Intel one. I've got a lot of tech basically is what I'm saying to you. But it also means over the last few weeks, I've been able to do a whole ton of comparisons, tests, and benchmarks, really get used to using these and not just rush out a review. So if you're gonna spend between two and five grand on one of these laptops, you wanna be pretty damn sure it's the right one for you. So let's start with three reasons why you shouldn't buy a new MacBook Pro 14 or 16. And the first one you can probably guess is if you're a big gamer. As powerful as the top spec M1 Max chip is, and we are talking 90 FPS in Shadow of the Tomb Raider, which is nothing to be sniffed at, outside of Apple Arcade games and a fairly basic Steam library, gaming is still a weak point for Max. Unless you're up for a bit of streaming with GeForce Now or Xbox Cloud Gaming, then actually with this 120Hz screen and a controller, it's not a bad setup. And so for me, this is the best way of actually gaming on a Mac. The second reason you shouldn't buy one of these is because for 98% of people, a MacBook Air is absolutely all you need. Ignore the Pro 13, the Air with the M1 is the sweet spot. And maybe get an external monitor if you need more screen space, but don't get caught up in the hype and pay nearly double for the entry-level Pro 14 unless you really need that extra performance or you just have to have the best screen. And thirdly, if you need a touchscreen. For that, well, an iPad Pro or a Surface Pro 8 would be a better choice. Although you can, of course, always get separate digital writing pads, which might be a better idea, actually. And while no laptop is perfect, and certainly there are a billion creator and pro Windows laptops out there with their beefy RTX graphics cards and 4K screens, Hopefully you guys know me by now. I'm not an Apple fanboy. I cover pretty much every kind of tech there is. I reckon as a package, these are the best laptops in the world, if you can afford it. The M1 Pro and Max chips just completely outclass the competition for both performance and efficiency. And also, as I say, the ability to perform just as well on battery, which is a huge deal for me. Then we've got this stunning mini LED ProMotion screen, which is also three times brighter for HDR, up to 1600 nits peak, 120 hertz. It's actually a little bit sharper than the old 16 inch. And with a one million to one contrast ratio, up from about 1300 to one, there's no more ugly dark gray bars when watching a movie. There is a little bit of blooming because this isn't an OLED screen, but it's really not bad at all. Then there's the updated 1080p FaceTime camera, which gives the class leading Microsoft Surface cameras a run for their money. We also get thinner bezels, albeit with a notch, louder and bassier speakers, the keyboard, now sans touch bar, and massive touchpad are still absolutely lovely to use. And on the sides, we get three Thunderbolt 4 ports, a fast UHS-2 SD card reader, and an HDMI 2 port, although not 2.1, sadly. To be fair, this new design is a good deal chonkier than before. It's both heavier and thicker, but even at 2.1 kilograms or 4.7 pounds for the bigger 16 inch, it's still a good 300 grams lighter than one of its closest rivals, the Dell XPS 17. Then there's extras like Touch ID and also battery life is pretty good. It does vary a lot and we'll come back to this in a second. And of course we have all the usual niceties of macOS Monterey and the Apple ecosystem with AirDrop, FaceTime, iCloud, you know, the usual stuff. Although one of the first things I download is a Windows style snap tool from the Mac App Store. I use Magnet and it just makes split screening apps a whole lot easier. Now, if we bring in the previous 2019 Intel powered MacBook Pro 16, the differences are quite striking. The notch, the black on black keyboard, the chunkier chassis, screen included, and lack of a touch bar. So there is an awful lot to like here, but don't get me wrong, these are not perfect by any stretch. And also they are very expensive. The 14 starts at £1,900 or $2,000, and it's 500 more for the 16 inch. The base model is absolutely the one I'd recommend, although I would probably pay the extra 200 to double the storage to one terabyte. But if you can afford it, and to be fair, the prices aren't ridiculous compared to the best from Asus, Acer, MSI, and Gigabyte and everyone else, which one should you go for? 
Well, Apple is usually the brand of simplicity, often to a fault, but right now there are four MacBooks on their store, including three Pros, with the 14 and the 16 being the two new ones. So should you go 14 or 16? Do you want the M1 Pro or the M1 Max? How many CPU and GPU cores would you like on your chip? Should you get 16, 32, or 64 gigs of RAM? And would you like it cheese and toasted? There are so many SKUs of these laptops, it's a bit ridiculous. And so while I haven't had every single model here with me to test, from my recent battery and performance test videos, I do have some thoughts. Okay, first question. Should you go for the 14 or the 16? The main difference is obviously the screen size. 14.2 versus 16.2, both with a 16 by 10 aspect ratio. They are both pretty hefty laptops, and even the 14 feels very dense, but the overall size of the 14, and also being 500 grams lighter, it does make it feel a good deal more portable. Plus you get the exact same ports, the same screen, and it shares the same specs as the 16, except for having a smaller 70 watt hour battery. However, paying 500 more for the 16 gets you a bigger battery, 100 watt hours versus 70. Also faster charging out of the box, you don't have to pay the extra 20 quid to get the 97 watt charger with this, you get 140 straight away with this, although fast charging only through the MagSafe 3 port. The 16 also starts with a 10 core CPU and 16 core GPU M1 Pro versus 8 and 14 on the 14 inch. So the bigger one is a bit faster out the gate, but you can of course upgrade the 14 to match. Also, if you spec the 16 with the M1 Max chip, you get this bonus energy mode option in the battery settings. All MacBooks have a low power mode, which adds about 10% to your battery life, but only this one has a high power option, which allows the fans to get louder, and in my tests, boost performance by around 10%, particularly in sustained workloads like a render or video export. But I think the biggest, less obvious difference between them is the battery life. Comparing the base models of both, uh, we're going to get about 11 hours on the 16 and about 8 hours on the 14. Although I am noticing I'm on just 3% battery, which is a very nice segue for me to show you something outside, but I'll need this. So this guy is the brand new Hyundai Ionic 5. Uh, they very kindly let me have a play with it for the last week or so, and also sponsor this video. Tons of cool stuff I want to show you, including the fact that I can actually charge my laptop. Boom, charging. So the Ionic 5 has a very nifty feature called vehicle to load. So if we open up the electric tailgate, charging cables under here though, reveals a three pin plug. Pop that in there. You can basically hook up anything you like, your camping gear, heating stuff, outdoor sound system, maybe even your lawnmower. There is so much space in here. It's a three meter long wheelbase car, so there's tons of room anyway, but because it's electric and it's been designed with that in mind, we've got flat floors, tons of storage space, everything's adjustable. And also these front two seats are the premium relaxation seats. Ah, oh dear. But front and center, we have these two huge 12.3 inch screens and the infotainment display on the left is a touch screen, but you can also give voice commands. There's also a heads up display, blind spot cameras that pop up when you indicate, full 360 cameras, which makes parking so much easier. And it can even park itself with the nifty remote smart parking assist. Now I'm not a professional car reviewer, but I've had a great time driving the Ionic 5. Uh, we're looking at 0 to 60 in 5.2 seconds with a 238 or 298 mile range depending on the model. So if you fancy checking out the new Hyundai Ionic 5, then click the link in the description below. But the next question is, should you pay the extra 900 pounds on the 14 or 600 pounds on the 16 to get the M1 Max chip, which also doubles the RAM to 32 gigs? Well, unless you're a money no object, give me the best because I'm rendering, blendering and designing all day long and really going to utilize that GPU. No, the M1 Max isn't worth it. It does make a difference, don't get me wrong, a big difference in the right tasks. But for most people, the base M1 Pro with 16 gigs of RAM is more than enough. The M1 Max is all about graphics with either a 24 or 32 core GPU and also double the memory bandwidth. The CPU performance is exactly the same as the Pro, and in my Adobe Lightroom test, which is more CPU intensive, it didn't make that much difference. But then in Premiere Pro and Final Cut and Blender, which do utilize the GPU, there is a substantial difference. So the M1 Max is certainly worth considering, but only if it makes sense for your workload, otherwise, save your money. 
And the downside of the M1 Max, aside from being quite a bit more expensive, is it does have an impact on your battery life. Quite a big one, although it depends on how you use it. The M1 Max shortens your battery life by 15 to 45% between light and heavy use. You'll still get about two and a half to three hours out of a top spec 16 with Max under very heavy load, which is still more than most Windows laptops with an RTX graphics card running at full whack. And of course you are getting that full performance even on battery. But of course, none of that really matters if you just plug it in. The only model I haven't tested is the M1 Max 14 inch, although I don't know if I would recommend it because already it has a shorter battery compared to the equivalent spec 16. Also, it does get a bit hotter, although not to any significant extent, but I don't think pairing this with an M1 Max really makes sense. There's a lot more money, it's gonna run hot and it's gonna destroy the battery. If you are gonna go Max, I would stick with the 16. And personally, I wouldn't bother paying for more RAM. It's 400 pounds to upgrade to 32 gigs, at which point you may as well pay the extra to get the M1 Max, which doubles the RAM for you anyway, so I'd put my money toward more storage instead. They both have super fast NVMe SSD storage, although non-upgradable, unfortunately, but not really surprising for a MacBook, but the higher capacity models do have significantly faster read and slightly faster write times, although realistically you'd struggle to notice the difference. So there is a lot to think about, but regardless of the spec you go for, both the 14 and the 16 get the same beautiful Super Retina XDR display with ProMotion, which is a lot of marketing spiel for not quite 4K, but still sharp, mini LED and high refresh. And it's adaptive, adjusting between 10 and 120 hertz, depending on what you're doing to save battery. And you really can feel that high refresh, scrolling through websites, scrubbing through your timeline, everyday stuff just feels faster and smoother. I do still think it's a bit of a shame that we haven't got a proper 4K or 4K plus resolution option, particularly on the 16, because while this is a nice balance between uh, sharpness and battery life, this retina resolution, you can't natively watch back 4K content, which I know is important for a lot of pro creators, although if it is a big deal, I would just output to a separate 4K monitor. And actually for me, when I'm at home in the studio, I'm usually hooked up to my ultra wide monitor via Thunderbolt, and I'm getting the full 3840 by 1600 resolution and 144 hertz refresh of my LG display. Again, this isn't full 4K either, but I like the extra screen space. But Apple's five grand Pro XDR display is still a good option, but it is only 60 hertz. And actually having a high refresh rate monitor like I've got here is definitely a plus, or else you will feel the slowdown going between the laptop's ProMotion screen and then your monitor. It's pretty funny, you can have these incredible laptops with some pretty serious upgrades, uh, and most people are just looking at this notch right here, which is, not ideal. No other laptop seems to need it. I'm a big fan of the XPS 15 and 17 and they've kind of spoiled me for that uh, super thin all round bezel. Granted their webcam's pretty terrible, but even with this, we're not getting any of that center stage or face ID stuff that we get on an iPhone. It is just a improved 1080p FaceTime camera. So in practice, the menu bar uses the space either side and it's often blacked out. And because these screens are 16 by 10, movies and TV shows have black bars anyway. So again, you can't see it. It really doesn't bother me. I'll tell you what, it's just good to see Apple listen to feedback and not take away ports or make life difficult for people just because it is different or looks better to make the chassis too thin so you have overheating issues. They've made it thicker, they've made it heavier, but they've made it a lot better. And for my money, these are the best pro laptops you can buy. I do still think the Air is the better choice for most people than the 14 inch MacBook Pro, but for my workflow, I mean, editing is literally half my job. The 16 inch with M1 Max is worth the investment. And since I've had this, I've barely touched my desktop PC, except for, well, gaming. So what do you reckon? 14 or 16, Pro or Max, or none of the above. Let me know what you make of these and if you've got any questions in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching guys. Don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button if you enjoyed the video and I'll see you next time right here on the Tech Jab.